You are listening to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with host Benny Gold. Lawyer Stories was founded in July 2017 on Instagram and is an expanding global network of lawyers and law students sharing their personal journeys to the noble profession of the practice of law. Join us on this podcast as we dig deeper into these stories and hear from lawyers and law students from around the world in all areas of the legal profession. Here at Lawyer Stories, we believe that every lawyer has a story. What's yours? Welcome to the Lawyer Stories podcast with Benny Gold, episode 30. Uh, Today, with pleasure, we welcome in our good friend, Ankit Kapoor, currently in Manhattan, New York City. How are you? I'm doing well, Ben. How are you doing? Good, man. Thanks for for joining us today uh, from New York City. I miss that place, man. How How are things out there? It's like uh, a lot of big cities, you know, during this pandemic, there's not a whole lot going on. Uh, Manhattan certainly not what it used to be. Uh, they were projecting that it'll be back to something what it used to be in a couple of years, but I actually just read a real deal article. They said definitely not until the middle of 2023. Wow. So they keep like extending it a year. I mean, I keep, yeah. I hate, keep hearing that's, that's unfortunate. I, I love to go visit there from New Haven, Connecticut. Um, but uh, cheers! Thanks for thanks for being here, man. We appreciate yeah, it. It's uh, it's good to see you. What are you what are you sipping on? I have my favorite type of whiskey, uh, Macallan. This Very is nice. Macallan Twelve. I like to go a little bit older, but this is what I had today. <laughs> Very nice. And uh, for those folks out there, I do recommend I'm I'm uh, sipping on Larceny Bourbon. It's very good. Um, Okay, so cheers to you. So I'm super psyched to have you here today because you're like one of the originals of Laura Stories. You sort of believed in like what I was doing. We started in July, 2017. I was posting these stories, October, 2017, uh, October 23rd to be specific. If anybody out there wants to scroll through the feed, we featured you. Um, You sent me, I think you might've been the first person to send me two photos where I did a split photo of you and your New York police department uniform and and just one as a uh, law student. And we, we put it up there and it was super cool. And I got to tell you, man, like I was super pumped back there and to uh, to feature you because of of being a New York uh, at the time you were a law student at yeah. night part time and you were a New York uh, police officer, which is super cool. Um, so a lot has happened since then. So we want to we want to dive into their into that uh, deeper. But first, like, let's go back to your story. Um, when was it? And this is something you do touch on in your story about wanting to become a lawyer after you saw that like 10% of what you were doing was only really arrests and the other 90% were like helping people and answering calls. So like, tell us a little bit about that, like went through your mind about uh, being a lawyer. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I I remember I was a rookie cop in Brooklyn. I worked in a very violent neighborhood at the time is Bed-Stuy. And afterwards, I worked in East New York, but most of my time was in Bed Stuy. You know, a rookie meaning like one year in, two years in. Uh, well, if you ask veteran cops, they'll say until you hit your fifth year, you're a rookie. Okay, but all right. I was about a year and a half in. Okay, and I was uh, I was still walking a foot post. You know, most of my job was downtime. That's what police work really is, and until you get a call, and then when you get a call, you. It's mostly by helping people and guiding them with what, what the right decision is, what their rights are, how the law can help them. You know, not contrary right. to what we see on TV, police work is not arresting people or shooting people. Right. They they, glor- they glamorize it or gl- not. It's not really glamorous, but you no. know, meaning like they they make it uh, they glorify it. Like they show people like cops running through the street arresting people, and <laughs> they, they show that ten percent of like of that. But you're saying. You know, the other 90% is really like explaining the law to people. Yeah, right. about 95% of it. You know, you get a domestic call and someone's hit, someone alleges they've, this person slapped me. You have to let them know whether you can arrest them or you, when you, well, why you can't arrest them. Right. Or if we do arrest them, what happens? You know, there's, there's so much more to police work than what we've seen, at least in 2020. You know, a lot of tragic incidents that happened in 2020 um, when it comes to policing and with the shootings we've seen. But that's not that's not really you know the large component of police work. So I was walking a po- foot post and I'm like I'm helping people. I'm answering questions. I'm 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 telling them about certain 
aspects of the law. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I think I, I want to do more of this. Right. I want to I counsel people more. So I was like, should I become a therapist? I was like, no. I was like, I probably need therapy on my own. <laughs> Did you think of like going into like an MSW program or something like that? Like, because I have, I did too, like MSW, yeah. like that sort of thing. But I thought about it at the time, but I, you know, it's, it's hard to make money that way. At least the type of money that I wanted to make. And I'm being totally frank. I want to make money. Yeah. Okay. So I, w I wanted to make money. And then I talked to a few cops and they said, you know, how they, you know, I don't know if this is true, but. I felt like in the NYPD, at least, divorce rate is way more than the national rate. That's amazing. Yeah. So I was like, I asked them what the divorce cost, and they said, "Oh, you know, I, we did mediation with six thousand dollars." So I'm like, you know what? If I get two clients a month, that's twelve thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Um, that's just two clients. Twelve thousand a month. That's twelve thousand. Twelve thousand a month. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, yeah. that's just two clients. Yeah. Um, I'm already gonna double my salary with just right. two clients at that low rate now. You know, my firm, the retainer, the minimum retainer is 25,000. So, yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. All right, we'll get there. But that, <laughs> I see the dollar, I see the dollar signs in your eyes. No, but that's, that's interesting because I used to think about that um, for closings. Like, if I did closings, you know, I could make, I need to do like this amount of closings per month to make this amount. So, it, and this is interesting because I was curious about how you pivoted sort of from like the criminal system over to, uh, like family law, did you ever handle like a lot of domestic violence, like at um, as a policeman? All the time, all the time. I had some, you know, minor domestic violence cases, and I had some major ones where you get there, the guy, uh, like one of the nephews, he was beat up and yeah. bleeding, and then he tells me, uh, "Yeah, I don't want anyone arrested." I was like, "What? <laughs> That's not how this works." It's like in the NYPD, at least, you know, domestic violence causes you don't. If this if it's an arrest situation, you don't have any discretion right. by department policy. So you have to arrest and try and arrest someone that that tells you that they they um, that the complainant doesn't want to press charges and that the family's there. They all gang up on you. Right. And I remember a very difficult situation that I, I was in turned into a huge fight. We ended up doing what we needed to do. However, you know, I went to all these domestic violence calls. I said and most of them didn't involve arrest situations. I remember one time someone called me that saying their son won't go to school. I said, you're calling the police for this? <laughs> but yeah. you, you, know, you're, you play so many different roles as a police officer. They really, you know, it's not a popular opinion, but they really don't get all the credit that they deserve. Yeah. Uh, however, I was like, you know what? I, I, I know I can do more. I, I think I have more to offer. How, so like, before you go there, like, so, so what made you get into that in the first place? Being a get police officer. What? The police officer. <laughs> um, it's very interesting. I, I was, I grew up in Long Island in Suffolk County. Okay. And cops in Suffolk County make a lot of money. A lot of money. Like, All right. So that's easily $200,000. What's that? Yeah. How much? 200000 yeah. after like 10 years with overtime easily. Okay. So I said, damn, I was like, I want to be a cop. It's cool. You get a uniform, you get a gun, you get to part of, get to part of be part of this fraternity in a way. Right. And then, um, but then I was like, when I was in, college i didn't pay attention to my grades really i wasn't a like a, a, a scholar you know i had yeah, yep. a 3.2 gpa because i wasn't really i didn't really care i was like i want to be a cop i don't and and then it was always an obsession to like i want to have this gun i want to have the uniform i want to yeah. have the groupies you know you grow <laughs> out you grow out of, out of all that eventually right um, but then I graduated uh, law. I graduated college about a semester early in December of 2010, and then I was I started my process with the police work uh, with the police department, and I was in the police academy in in July of 2011. I was still 21 years old. I wow. didn't even turn 22. Yeah. So, you know, you have to remember in 2010, we're, we were at the peak of the recession. Right. So there weren't that many jobs available to college grads with zero experience. So I was actually fortunate to find myself into a career with health benefits, with pension, with, with stable guaranteed paycheck, essentially every other week. Right. And uh, right. I, I, yeah, I ended up starting the police department in July of 2011 and I wrapped up my time in April of 2018. So, so you were there a few years and then you, you, you know, you were answering all these questions, like 10% was arrests and all that like action. And then 90% was strolling the street talking to people and then 
where I cut you off before I apologize was you saying like, you know, I thought I could do something more. Right. So yeah. Tell, tell me about that. Like you said, I, th- I thought I could do something more. Like I wanted to, to advance in what I was yeah, doing. I, I wanted to like one, I wanted a more stable schedule, although I was in a position where the schedule was very stable. I wanted like a normal type of life. I wanted some, I wanted a career that was more intellectually stimulating. Okay. Um, that was the big, that was a big thing for me. And I, and I won, and also I wanted to make more money. Look, man, I, I live in the, on the Upper East Side in New York. Yes. I want to continue being able, I want to continue to live on the Upper East Side. And it's very expensive to live in the city. You know, you pay, you know, you pay a premium to live in you do. urban cities. Uh, you got, or you got to live with eight guys and put a wall up. You know, you got to, you got to build those walls. They do like, yeah. walls. <laughs> people get lost and they put walls up, but I'm forced and I live alone. So, right. That's great. But I, uh, so and then, so going back to the money, I was like, okay, you know what? I want something more intellectual stimulating, intellectually stimulating. I want to make more money. I'm in the law. What are my strengths? I'm already in the law. So maybe I should consider law school. Or at one point, I also thought business because my father has been an entrepreneur. So that was a question I wanted to, I wanted to ask you because I like to go from the beginning. Your parents were entrepreneurs. Yes. I just want to know before we go go further with you, like what kind of, can you tell us what kind of businesses they were in? What kind of well, my My father has he he had to start his own business when he was very very young to take care of his parents he started like a a factory in india and he grew he bought another factory he kind of grew that then there came a point in india where he thought that there we needed to do we needed more it wasn't enough opportunity for him there wasn't enough money for him there wasn't a future for his kids there and also outside of america at least back then, people had an obsession of coming to America. Right. Yeah. You know, a lot of a lot of people still do. So I had family here, and we were on a on a waiting list uh, through my aunt, and we ended up getting called in 1999. I was nine years old, almost ten at the time. So we came here. My dad worked at a deli, and he made two hundred and fifty dollars a week. Okay. Well, you know, back we, then though, you know, hey, back then I would think maybe it, it was about six seven hundred dollars a week today in today's money right maybe so it wasn't a lot of money with, plus you or, got that deli meat man you had these fat turkey sandwiches to eat, right? <laughs> you know, free bagels every morning bagels are legit all right yeah so, go so ahead. then he worked there and then he started he he said he said i don't want to work for anyone anymore he bought his own deli he bought so he really expanded that operation he had one of the most um one of the better delis in queens and then he he sold that. He bought another one, and then he bought another one in Long Island. During between that, we also owned a uh, frozen yogurt store. Wow! Okay. So he's been in the food business, and right now yeah. he's he's actually in India right now, trying to start a honey import business. Wow. He wants to be a distributor of honey here in New York because eighty percent of the world's honey is actually imported, uh, exported from India. Interesting. So uh he's he's always been this entrepreneur you know and you know this is what i grew up with right so you have an entrepreneurial spirit right so yeah you're at the police department and then you 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 went into law school like you got a sweet deal like you went to brooklyn law and but you were going part-time while you still work full-time at the police department what was that like oh man that was a freaking nightmare wow how long was that four years you had to do that I had to do that all four years. Well, I finished law school in three and a half years because okay. I took summer courses because it, it just wasn't sustainable to like work that much and go to school at night. And my first year of law school, I actually worked midnights. So I would go to, cl- I would, I would go to class first. I, I would sleep from like 10 to four. I'd go to class from six to 10, you know, one L year, your toughest year. Yep. From six to 10, I'm in class. And then from 11 to eight, I'm working overnight. Oof. And during my meal hours, I would open up my torts book yeah. and, 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 you know, take, do my outlining and do my highlighting and all that good stuff that you have to do in law school. So that was a, it was a tough first year. Yeah. And then I found myself in a more uh, stable role where I worked Monday to Friday. I was offered a position by the person in charge of the precinct at the time. And then I, I had a more stable, like, remaining time in law school. But it, look, no matter what job you have, to work all day and then sit through class at night, it, it's, it's not easy. Well, they don't. I remember being a first-year law school, and they recommended, like, don't work 
your first year and there you are working the night shift man that's yeah. that's crazy that's a lawyer story for you right there like that's that's crazy um surprised like the precinct didn't work out like hey like uh you know you got to be a prosecutor for five years and you know we'll do this for you like or whatnot but that that's interesting that you had a that must have been super hard to to do that i mean yeah i i knew i wanted to leave the police department so the police department does have a scholarship program where they give you a certain amount of money and in return you have to stay in the police department three or four years following your graduation okay and i said you know i was like i was like i don't want to do this like i don't want to be tied down to something right right you know, maybe that's part of my commitment issues but i was like i don't want to be tied down to <laughs> that's that. another podcast my friend yeah. <laughs> like, i don't want to be tied down to the police department yeah. what am i going to law school for and then fortunately, I was able to get a six-figure scholarship for Brooklyn Law School. Yeah, that's incredible. And I was like, you know what? It's a no-brainer. From, so actually, from the police department, you got that? No, school? from the law school. From the law school, okay. Yeah, here, here's the secret. The law school actually had offered me $40,000. That's the law school. And I had okay. other law schools offer me um, a little bit more than that. Okay. So I played the law schools against each other. To see who wanted me more. Did you really? You did that. You were you yeah. were attentive enough to do that, which is really yeah. uh, impressive. Okay. So that forty thousand dollars offer was raised to a hundred thousand when I was done with negotiation. So that's what I got to go. Really? To. Yeah. They do that. So that's a great tip for everybody out there. Like, mm -hmm. if you get a if you get an offer for a scholarship from one school and another school, like play them. Like with play them, yeah. Wow. I, I did it. I, I actually how did, you, how did you do like the counter? Like how did you tell one school that you got more at another school? Like what how did you call them? Did you write them a letter? Like what did you do? I sent them a very, very nice email and I said, look, you know, St. John's is offering me X. You've offered me Y. I want you to at least meet or exceed X. So they would exceed X. And uh I think at the time I, I was it was is it was one, I'm, you know, look, I don't really see myself as a pe person of color, but I am diverse. You know, I add to the diversity. I, pool. I am diverse. All right. You know, okay. in the law school. You are I, diverse. I, yeah, I, I don't use it to my advantage, but if it helps me, if, if someone else sees that as an advantage. That might somewhere. also be a different podcast. on Yeah. <laughs> but yes, no, no, that's true. Very true. Okay. So then, so then um, I use them like you know, played them against each other. I said, you know, see who wants me more. And I was, a, I was a police officer that helped. And then I ended up choosing Brooklyn law school because I was uh, working in Brooklyn. I was living in Brooklyn. So I said, you know what, I might as well go to school in Brooklyn. It was, it was a no brainer. Yeah. And, and like, what was your biggest challenge of law school? Would you say? Just reading, reading, yeah. reading, reading. I hate reading. Okay. Well, that, that's going to be a problem when you go to law school. If you hate yeah. reading, it's going to no, be like I get you. Book. Like I, I would spend all day like reading. Oh my goodness! I no, I totally agree. You're reading hundreds of pages a week, as, at least at, at least in the begin at the first year in the first year of law school, right. and it was tough, man. It, it was tough, like prepping for finals. You know, I, I didn't have the luxury to go into study groups. You know, people would go into study groups all day and talk. Right. I didn't have the luxury. Yeah. My, luxury my study group was my police car during my 3 a.m. lunch, 3 to 4 a.m. lunch hour. Did you ever wear your, uh, did, so did you ever wear like your uniform to class and stuff? Like where you had to go right after to your shift? Like, did you, were you wearing your uniform, like packing the gun and stuff, like in the classroom? No, I, I never wore my uniform, but. You know, I, I, I do have a pistol permit. I did carry firearms then. I, I, I still have guns. So if I was like in court and I had my gun with me, you know, I'm in a suit, I would have my gun with me when I was in school. Uh, but I never like flaunted the uniform. I, yeah. I never did that because- Well, let me ask you, okay, so, so go, cause we're gonna move past law. You've done some incredible things like since law school, but I, I'm very curious, like what, um, like, did you gravitate, you didn't gravitate towards criminal law or did you in law school? No, I never did. I, uh, the criminal law stuff didn't interest me that much. And if you look at New York City crime statistics, contrary to what's happening now, yeah. since 1990, crime has went down by like 90%. Major crime has went down by 90%. So, excuse me, I'm a numbers guy. 
and I looked at the numbers and I said, it, I don't want to be in an area of the law where I'm fighting for a shrinking piece of the pie. So I, criminal law was never really an option for me. I wanted to do some other, other things. Really? So you weren't like, I don't want to do, I want to do criminal defense or in, in your criminal procedure and criminal law classes, were you answering a lot of questions like being, you know, cause you knew a lot of that, right? Like and even cr- constitutional law, I have to under, like, I have to think that you knew a lot of that from being on the police force, right? Yeah, I, uh, I, I took criminal procedure. It, it's a step up from your first year criminal, okay. criminal law class. And it was really interesting. And, you know, the funny thing is I had two other classmates who were also police officers at the time. And the professor had no idea she has three cops sitting in her class really? the entire semester. She had no idea. And she was super, super liberal. Like she, she was a former pro, uh, U.S. attorney. She, she made it clear in so many words that she did not like the, the police force. Okay. So, but it, it was interesting to sit in class. But despite her views, it was... Uh, it was a great learning experience. And okay. we did have a lot to um, say in, the, in that class. That's good. So, so you get out of law school. And, and this is, and going back to uh, our feature that we did on Laura's stories, um, you were still a, you were a student. You were close to graduating, but you get out of law school. Like, what was your first job like? You don't have to mention any names or like what you did, but like, what was, uh, what was that like? Your first law? I feel like a lot of people's, a lot of attorneys, young attorneys, first legal job is difficult. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to mention names because no. it, it's not even relevant, but I, I worked as a uh, assistant corporation counsel. So I was an attorney for the city in, in civil cases, not criminal cases. You know, when you're a prosecutor, you're, you're an attorney for the city too, but you're in criminal cases. So I did civil work and I did tort defense for the city. So someone gets hit by uh, a bus, yep. someone trips and falls on the sidewalk, someone gets assaulted by a police officer. You know, I'm defending the city in those right. lawsuits. And I got to tell you, Ben, it was one of the best jobs I've had. Really? I haven't had a lot of jobs, but it was one of the best jobs. It was a great learning experience. Yep. Within, within a couple of weeks, I was in court on my own arguing my first motion. And you don't get that in law firms. You don't yep. even get that opportunity in my law firm. Yeah. You have to like earn your way to that. You have to earn your trust to that. So I, I was arguing motions every week. I even did my own trial as a lead, lead counsel, which is unheard of. And I got a good result. So I, I had, I got great litigation experience and my colleagues at the law department were very helpful. They treated me really well. They, uh, you know, trained me really well. Yep. So I'm forever grateful without that, without their help and that foundation, I wouldn't, be able to move on from the law department. Wow. Okay. So that, so that's interesting. So then where, where did you go from there? So from there, I was, uh, I, while I was still in the law department, they assigned me to a specific part in court where I was appearing before the same judge every week. Okay. Every week, every week, every week. And like, people don't know this, so I'm going to reveal it on the podcast. So one day she pulled me aside. She said, you know, you're, you're a good attorney. I like you. I, I feel like the law department is going to rise you through the ranks. I was like, oh, thank you. You know, I appreciate that. But I was like, I actually want to be a, in, I actually want to be in match in matrimonial law. She said, really? <laughs> she said, I want to be a matrimonial judge. I was like, wow. oh, and now she, you know, she's a, a judge. I was in the transit part. So she was overseeing cases in which New York city transit is involved. Okay. So She's like, really? I said, yeah. I was like, well, you know, time will come. I was like, I, I'm, I'm learning. I'm still learning. I, I don't think I'm ready for private practice. And uh, she's like, why do you want to do that? I was like, well, I want to make money. Like, I don't want to work for the city forever. So she's like, okay, that's fair. So two weeks later, she pulls me aside. She gives me the name of a firm. Okay. She said, look, I want you to contact them. They're looking for someone. And I think you'd be a great fit. Wow. I said, thank you. I'll think about it. But right now I'm happy where I am. I'm not, I'm not making a lot of money. I think I was making seven right not even seventy thousand dollars okay I, I took a pay cut from the police department to work there yes yeah. so for the experience so i i said i'm getting great experience i don't want to go anywhere so so she said just think about it so i was like okay i'll think about it i thought about it I was like, it's not worth it two weeks later she pulls me aside again she's like did you call that firm i said i did not i'm sorry it's like i'm just not looking she's like just call them you never know you may not even be a good fit they may not even like you i said Fine. I was like, as a courtesy to you, I'll call them. 
So I look up the firm, it's four partners. They're all wonderful uh, women who are great attorneys, well-known in New York City. So I said, this is interesting. You know, uh, historically uh, being a lawyer has been male dominated. Right. I was like, I was like, I want to, I would want to work for women. It's a different, different perspective you get from them. Right. Right. So I contact yeah. them. I had a short phone, phone, phone interview. They said, you know what, come in for an in-person interview. We want to meet you. So I met them uh, the week after Memorial Day weekend in 2019. Again, at this time, I was like, I don't want to do this. And I, I walk into the Microsoft building. That's where their, the offices were, still are. And I got there at 3 p.m. and I left at 6.30 p.m. Ooh, okay. So needless to yeah. we hit it off. Yeah, you hit it off. And you started on Monday. Well, I was invited back because we had to work out the, the details of the salary because, you know, I, w I was looking for a, a price that, yeah, yeah. That, I, that, that I would be enough for me to leave the law department. So they offered me something and then I, I accepted and I started the first week of July, right after uh, July 4th weekend. Yep. And uh, I'm still there. I mean, it's a different firm now, Amazing. but I'm still there. Matrimonial yeah. firm too. Yeah. So like what made you, so with all the background being a police officer and like with matrimonial, like why did you end up going, I mean, to, with criminal, like why did you end up going to matrimonial? Well, I figured I said, like, I know you mentioned a lot of the money thing, like with yeah, divorces, yeah, yeah. but. But aside from the money, you know, the money is a byproduct of the work you do and how well you do it. Right. So I said, you know, when I was a cop, people call 911. They're not in a good time. They're having a terrible time. So when does a person call a divorce lawyer in a terrible freaking time? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. Be, it's another reason for me to be a divorce lawyer. Yeah. I'm, I'm also fascinated with relationships and and the dynamics that go behind a relationship yep. and, and, and how a relationship evolves and how it breaks down. And, and uh, you know, I'm fortunate to witness enough relationships like my parents who've been married for 30 plus years, but right. there are ways for relationships to work. So that was my reason. I said, people call 911 in a bad time. They call divorce attorney for a bad time. I think I'd be a good fit for this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, uh, and, and that's how I chose so that. You, so you, you made a little pivot. So, you, you know, it doesn't have to be straight on criminal, but this is something that you still saw and had like some experience in because you were answering all those calls. So that's great. Right. Um, so like you became a partner, like how long have you been there? And like, what's, what's going on there? Like, how, how are you doing? Like, how has COVID changed the practice? Uh, COVID has uh, 20, so 2020. Let me back up. 2019, I was hired as an associate. Okay, a year. And I was admitted to practice law in New York in August of 2018. You know, I, wouldn't, I want to talk about the timeline. And in, in, no, August of 20, now I want to back up. August of 2018, yes, I was admitted to practice law. Yep. July of 2019, I switched to a new firm. And then COVID happened in 2020. Mm -hmm. Now COVID made everything virtual. I haven't stepped inside a courtroom in almost a year now. Everything's virtual, as you know, as everybody knows. Uh, a lot of custody issues with with you know social distancing protocols, mask wearing. Right, right. Some people believe in COVID. Some people don't believe in COVID. Some people don't take the necessary precautions. So it created a lot of issues in our cases. But it it, it was good. It was good for business. We kept us busy. 2020 was a very busy year. I build a lot of hours. Let's just say I was over 2,000 hours in, in 2020. Wow. So in, um, in December, just last month, they, the, two of the partners approached me. They said, look, the firm is actually dissolving. And they're going, there were four partners, two went on the other side, and two went on, on the side I'm on. So we would like you to come with us. I said, okay. I was like, I, I, I weighed out my pros and cons and, and I wasn't offered partnership at the time, but I knew who I wanted to work with at least for right. now. And I had, with these two partners, I was on most of their cases. So yep. it, was, it was just a, a no brainer. So then I, I accepted and, and then a week or so, maybe two weeks later, they said, yeah, like we're, at, we're gonna make you a partner. I said, really? I said, okay. I was like, you remember when I told, when we had the interview, 
you remember what I said to you? They said, yeah, you told us you wanted your name on the door. They asked, me, they asked me, where do you see yourself in five years? I said, I see my name on the door right next to yours. Yeah. And it was a very ballsy thing to say. Yeah, but you know, why not? Um, to, to people that have been practicing for 40 years. So she, she said, uh, we're going to make you a partner. And guess what? Your name's going to be on the door. Yep. I said, what? I said, really? Like, yeah, we're, you're not even good. You're, you're going to be an equity partner not just a, a, a junior partner, you're gonna be an equity partner. I said, wow. I said, bring it on. You yeah, know? that's awesome. I, yeah. I couldn't ask for anything Congra more. Congratulations. Like that's that's like, uh, that's big time. So like, what, is, what does that mean? Like obviously you share in the equity and all that and now that and- uh, Well, that means, uh, you know, you gotta buy in to the partnership. You gotta you know? buy in, right? You have to buy in, that's fair. Yep. And, and then, you have a you have a salary and then you get a, a percentage of the profits. So, is that like a month? You get like a monthly percentage or like is it a uh... no annual annual? And you you you're no longer a W two employee. You you get a draw. Yeah. You buy weekly draw. You, you know you take that money out and you're responsible for paying your own taxes. And my accountant told me how much money I have to put aside every month for tax purposes. I said I'm not happy with what you're telling me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's um but it also aside from the money kind of shifts your mindset. Yeah. Because one, I'm part, my two partners are two women who have been practicing for 40 years. So I have been given like a, a an amazing, extraordinary opportunity. Yeah, for sure. To call these two wonderful women, my partners. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they're older, they're, um, they're so vibrant, they're getting clients They work very hard. They don't want to retire. They want to build, they want to continue to build their careers and now build a, a, a new law firm. So it shifts your mentality a little bit. It's now I'm not no longer an employee. Thank you. We'd love to feature them on lawyer stories, man. Like <laughs> I'm sure they'd love to be on it. I'm sure. Well, bring them by. We'll do it, man. I'll talk to them. So then it was, it's the three of us. I said, we need more people. They said, well, do you have anyone in mind? I said, yeah. I was like, I actually work with, someone in my last job went to law school with him i think he would be a good fit so i brought him in for an interview and he was hired two two hours later that's amazing wow and that's uh, a good friend right there that's a good yeah. friend and I, we know we gave him a substantial raise from what he was making because he was still working for the city you know when yeah. you work in government you don't make a lot of money yeah and yep. he's a good friend he's very yeah. humble he actually graduated law school two years before me okay so now he's you know my associate but I don't see him like that. I see him as a, as a partner, someone that I'm going to just has to get you coffee three days a week. Right. Yeah. He said, don't ask me to get me coffee. I'm just said, Don't worry. I said, don't worry. I only drink tea now, but I'm kidding. I said, I would never, I would never. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. My, my partners, okay. my, my two partners treated me as their partner, even though I was an associate. So that's huge. I mean, just imagine where you're going, man. Like, you know, a few years at a law school and you're already partner of a firm and that's just incredible experience. Like, where do you see yourself in a few years from now? A few years, you know, I, I, I see us running a thriving practice. Okay. I see at least, you know, we're like long-term aspirations, like not just a few years, but like, you know, when you're 40. When I'm 40, so I'm 31 now. Okay. When I'm 40, I want to expand into other areas of law. I don't know if I want to particularly practice other areas. However, I want to bring on more partners in the future to have like a, a larger firm, okay. you know, like a thriving firm that people that can come to for the real estate matters, for the commercial litigation matters, for the corporate matters. And I want to have partners that bring it, that can bring in that type of business. So I see myself, you know, being a managing partner of a much larger firm right now is four attorneys and we have some staff. So I'd like to see at least 20 attorneys, at least at the minimum, and you know a comparable staff for the for the right, yeah that's good that's a good uh that's a good goal yeah i want, I want to see i want to i want to i want to grow like my father i'm an entrepreneur i want to grow i want to expand and ben i gotta tell you being able to offer my friend a job at my firm or bring them in it's it's so rewarding to see someone else's face light up because yeah. they can make x money and they're gonna work with so and so and they're gonna meet they're gonna have such and such clients it, yep. it really shifts your mindset when you're uh, an employer versus an employee yeah. no it's incredible um so and you know I've, I've got to witness the journey too like through our communications and your you know your lawyer story obviously like it's just uh you know 
I've gotten to see your lawyer story sort of flourish too. So it's, it's super cool. Um, so like if you, uh, so actually let me ask you a question. So how important is it to you to have a mentor? Like, do you think mentors are important in general? Yeah, uh, without a doubt. My mentor actually tagged me in, a, in an Instagram post the other day. And my mentor, by the way, is Robert Brown, who was a former NYPD captain turned attorney. Okay. So I, he tagged me in a post on Instagram. He said, we'd, we'd love to feature Robert Brown too, by the way. So. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell Robert. And the post said, having a mentor is like having a cheat code for life. Yep. That's exactly what it is. You know, you have to be, you have to seek mentors. You know how I found Robert? I, I was in a, a criminal law class and we were doing a case that he was the defense attorney on. So I picked up the phone and I called him. I called his office. I was like, I want to speak to Robert Brown. They're like, who the hell are you? <laughs> I said, I'm a cop. I'm a law student. I think Robert would want to hear from me. I'm doing a presentation on the case that he defended. That was a high profile case in New York City. Very yeah. high profile. So I found Robert that way and we met at one point and we ended up uh, hitting it off and he invited me to a, a couple of parties he was being honored at and, and, and we talk on, on a weekly basis. I give him cases now. Wow. He sends cases my way. It's so we've actually developed a, a great relationship and every career decision, Ben, I run by him. Even yeah. when I was offered partnership. So, I, so, that, that, so that's incredible. I mean, like, so... So do you ever ask him anything about, hey, like, you know, I have this case, like, what do you think I, which way do you think I should take it? Or like, it's not really like that. Oh, it's like that. When I was at my last job and I was assigned to do a trial and everyone went home at six o'clock because he worked for the government, people, not, not many people stay late. And I'm <laughs> prepping for my, my, my cross-examination. It's like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I have no idea. So I call Robert. I was like, Robert, what do I do here? And uh, he, wa- he stayed on the phone with me for a couple of hours and he walked me through everything. Wow. Yeah, that's so nice. Yeah. I won that trial, by the way. You won, yeah. That's yeah. Oh, that's terrific. I know it's uh, all right. So, so your answer in short is like mentors are very important, and uh, I, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. So, um, so like if you could go back and change anything, and and this is like kind of a crazy question to ask somebody who's thirty one, like you stated, because you're super young. Like hindsight is 20, like you can't tell how, how young you are now and how much time you have, but like, what would you, what would you tell yourself? Like if you could go back in this journey, say, say something, what would it be? It's a very broad thing, but I would just, I wish I was nicer to some people, man. Nicer. Like who, who are you not nice to man? I'm nice to everyone, but I, I, there were times, you know, I, I, I don't like to think of myself as like as arrogant as I once was, but my cockiness and my arrogance in, in the past have gone in my own way. And my law school professor, who's a New York State Supreme Court judge, he always said, he said, you know, you can always catch more bees with honey than vinegar. So I wish I, I if I went, if, if I was nice to the people, I would have more friends right now. And, and I, I try, you know, I don't like to be like my old self and, that that's my one thing that I would change. And that's something that I've learned from over the years. Okay. Yeah. Why you think that's affected your practice or something or like, uh, no, I, I, ironically, and fortunately it has not affected my career growth, but I also don't want it to um, bite me in the ass one day. So it's always better to be nice than not nice, you know? And but yeah, I, I like to, I like to think of myself as generally nice. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, you know, you turn over new leaf, you know, you're doing well with anything. Um, so like, what do we leave out in this podcast episode? Like, you know, we covered, we, we covered your way back when, you know, we're talking about you being a partner, um, mm-hmm. making the pivot to from criminal to sort of being a policeman to matrimonial attorney and partner at a firm in Manhattan. And uh, by the way, if you ever see anybody on lawyer stories when you're scrolling that you want to connect with, just let me, and you don't want to, I mean, you'll probably reach out to them, but if you want me to make like the formal introduction, like I'll do that, man. Like if we ever, if you ever see somebody from wherever that you need, or if you need an attorney, like in some state, just let me know and I'll try to hook it up. So uh, I appreciate that. Although yeah. I, I will say when I want to talk to someone, I manage my way to find them and then talk to them. I'm sure I, I remember, uh, you know, I remember featuring you 
uh, back in the day, like I said, I was super like pumped to do that because I just, I knew your, your post would do well, you know, um, everybody at that point, and we still do respect um, the New York Police Department very much so, and you were an attorney and it was just great. And uh, you were telling me how many, how many uh, direct messages you were getting and like, you know, all that sort of thing. So that was, that was fun. Yeah, that was, that was an interesting time. Like you said, it was 2017. I was still a law student. I was still yeah. working as a, as, as a cop. And uh, look, man, I, I, I've, I've had a lot of people, you know, I've worked hard, but people help you along the way. I'm, I can't say I'm self-made at all. I've reached out to, I've reached out to people to mentor me in different areas of my life. I've, I've uh, had law school professors that like met with me after class and walked me through things. But that's all you, like you didn't, it's not like they would do that on their own time. Like you, yeah. you're saying law school, like you went up and you did that and you said, I need to talk to this person about this and I need to do this. It's all you, like whatever you do is the choices you make. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I know like from being a law student and an attorney that like, they're not going to do it for you. Like if you did something, it's because you made the move. You know what I'm saying? Like you were the, uh, the catalyst. You were the catalyst. Sure. Yeah. You, you have to, I always say, if you don't ask, the answer will always be no. That's exactly so, right. Whether it's like a right. girl out, you know, <laughs> you gotta yeah. ask. The yeah. worst thing someone could tell you is no. I actually, I had a lawyer that I reached out to once. I, I still remember during law school and uh, he ended up, Funnily enough, he ended up being opposing counsel in one of my cases a few months ago, but I reached out to him during law school for like mentorship. And he said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm busy with my practice. I'm busy with my family and my children. I don't, I don't have time to mentor anyone. And fair enough, you know? So I was told to no. know it, it happens, but yeah. you have to be willing to ask. You have to be willing to ask for help. You do. You have to be. And a lot of, and believe me, that's, he's in the minority because I think a lot of people like to help people. So I agree with you. I, I reached out to a, a real estate lawyer, a well-known real estate lawyer in New York City last week who built, uh, I read his interview on Attorney at Law Magazine, and he's built a great law firm with 20 plus attorneys. So I said, you know what? I'm going to call this guy and see if I can get an, uh, a Zoom call with him to get to know him. What can I do to start off on the right foot just like and build something like he's yeah. built? And uh, I have a Zoom call with him on Monday at 10.30. So that's awesome. It's all, you know, it's, that's great. That's, uh, yeah. you got to keep doing that, man. So is there anything like you wanted to cover that we did not cover today, Ankit? Um, nothing comes to mind at the, at the moment. Okay. I okay. wish we weren't in COVID, that's all. I know, I know, man. I Believe me, it's been, it's been a tough uh, year now, so... But uh, so how can people get in touch with you? You're on Instagram. You have an email address. Yeah, my Instagram is A-N-K-I-T underscore ESQ. -E so Ankit underscore ESQ. That's my Instagram. And if they want to email me, they can email me on my firm address is A Kapoor, A-K-A-P-O-O-R at C-S-K law dot com. So the CSK stands for Cohen, Stein, Kapoor, and I'm the Kapoor, obviously. Kapoor, that's right. The name on the door. Third yeah, name right there. The Congratulations on your being a partner. That's amazing. Thank um, you. So everybody, or if you if you forget that and want to reach out to Laura's stories, we'll, we'll get you in touch with Ankit as well. Um, we appreciate everybody tuning in to Laura's Stories Podcast with Benny Gold, episode 30. Wherever you are in the world today, enjoy yourselves. The Lawyer Stories podcast is produced by Marketing the Law. Are you looking at your social presence every day? Potential clients are. Learn how to magnetize your brand with the help of Marketing the Law. Find us on Instagram at Marketing the Law to learn more.